Hey everybody, welcome. Um, as you know, oh, I got one, thank you, Neil. Uh, as you all know, and you can tell by the slide that uh, mobile first design and development. Um, so if you're here, you're gonna probably know at least some of the answer to this first question, which is how important is mobile? Um, to me, even though I've been pushing very heavily inside of Liferay, we have to go mobile first, do everything mobile first, the stats still kind of blew me away. Um, in 2014, 1.8 billion phones were shipped versus 276 million PCs and 256 million tablets. That's more phones shipped in three, or three months than all of the PCs for the entire year. I normally don't think of it in that scale because I upgrade my phone every two years and then you know I figure everyone else does too, but 1.8 billion phones sold. So mobile is really important. This quote's from Google. 90% of users use multiple screens sequentially to accomplish a task over time. I think we all do this, we all can identify with this. You may be watching TV, you check up something on your phone, you say, you know, I'm gonna look at that later. You go to your computer, you pull it up, maybe you send it off somewhere else. Um, but you're using multiple devices to actually accomplish a single task. This, and this is the new reality. Not just that we are using all these devices to accomplish a single task, but that there's an entire generation that is completely influenced and it, it will completely change your mind. This is the new reality. This is my two-year-old niece. My sister-in-law posted on Facebook. She stayed with us for a while. I showed her my computer. She had no idea what in the world to do. She looked at the keys, just stared, and then just yelled at me to put on a cartoon. Whereas with this, she can go in, she can automatically jump to her shows and do whatever she wants. But this sort of thing is going to completely change how they think about technology and how they interact with it and what they expect. Um, for a lot of us, we're just used to accomplishing stuff with our normal computer. But there's an entire generation of people where this won't be the case. So we need to be prepared for it. So what do we mean by mobile first? As I've been talking about it with people, I realize that people get a lot of different ideas by what I mean. It has its own kind of baggage. So mobile first is not a business term, and it does not mean engaging with your customers is the first point of the Metafabric experience. Like it, It's not any sort of jargon like that. And the other thing people get confused on is, oh, that means you just take whatever your mobile view is and shove it onto the desktop. And that is not what it means either. What it is is it's a strategy for achieving device agnostic websites and web apps using responsive web design and progressive enhancement. Basically, you're just targeting the, the worst environment first or the most constrained environment first and addressing that and then scaling up from there and adding in stuff later. And this provides some benefits. But I want to talk first about what device agnostic design kind of means. Earlier this year, uh, Trent Walton created this uh, blog post, and it's kind of like an essay about device agnostic design. And really, instead of thinking about like, oh, well, we need to do everything for a phone first, what you're doing is you're saying, what is the most broadest situation that I can actually attain that's going to solve most people's needs? And then from there, progressively enhance the site to take advantage of features that each one may have. So developers have long had a very bad case of app envy. They really want to have a native app. And I think we've all seen this. It's basically a bunch of web components completely styled to look like something from a native app. But it kind of shows off an insecurity of web developers when they do this, because what they're really trying to do, is, or what they're saying is, well, that's, that's the superior experience, so let's go ahead and try to make that. But in reality, the whole native versus web thing, it's, it's a false dichotomy, and it's also just a, the wrong way to kind of look at it. Here's how it is, because for a lot of, a lot of time, or a long time, uh, web developers and native developers are constantly arguing about who's going to win out, and eventually everyone's either going to be writing applications with web technologies or they're going to be doing it with native technologies, and that one of them will die off. I don't believe that. The way it actually goes right now is the web can accomplish so much across every device, and each of those devices can accomplish much more because they're hardware and all of the features that they have. And eventually, it'll just keep going up where imagination goes. 
as this happens, the hardware is still going to be able to take advantage of things that the web doesn't even have standards for. But the web does have a benefit because it goes across all those devices. But it's not a contest. The contest doesn't exist because they each have their own strengths. If this guy is constantly, all the time, comparing himself to this guy, of course he's going to feel inferior. He's going to think that he's, you know, completely the, the worst dog in the world because he doesn't live up to him. But instead of comparing apples and oranges and pugs and bull mastiffs, think in terms of the trade-offs of each environment and each medium. Because there are things that this guy can do that this guy should not be doing. And each one has their benefits, and each one has different things what they're good for. There's a better way. There's a better way to think about all of this, and that is to go with the grain of the medium. Go with the, the grain of what you're working on and leverage it to its strength. There's this quote by Bruce Lee that I love. Um, I'm going to play it for you, and hopefully the sound all comes through and works. But it's really awesome, and it kind of exemplifies exactly what uh, I mean by going with the grain of the medium. Empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. Now who knew Bruce Lee was such a good web developer? I certainly didn't. But in reality, that, when you think about the content on your page and you think about fluid design and having it adapt to different devices, it is a really good analogy. And when you really look at it, the web isn't so much a platform as it is a continuum. A continuum of devices, the broad spectrum, a continuum of capabilities, ah, and a continuum of hitting the wrong button, um, and a continuum of constraints. So what are some of the strengths of the web? Ubiquity, it's everywhere. The web is the most widely deployed technology or a runtime of any technology. And honestly, as a front-end developer, I do think that's worth celebrating, even if it rubs it into another runtime that <laughs> says it runs everywhere. Um, another one of the strengths is variability. Now, some people would say, you know, this is kind of a problem because uh, now you have all these different environments, but it's not, it's not a constraint, it's a feature that we don't have to wait for a standards body to say, hey, this is all you're allowed to do. We get to leverage things. We get to test them, see, hey, does this work here? Go ahead and support this. There are constraints, though, that we have to live with. The CPU is constrained. WebKit is faster than IE, and as a web developer, I constantly have this discussion like, oh, well, IE's dying off, WebKit, we can just, you know, we don't have to worry about performance, it's so much faster. But in reality, an iPhone 4S, which is not that old of a phone and way more powerful than a lot of the lower-end Android phones that get shipped out, it's equivalent in speed to around IE8. So we still need to focus on performance and still keep an eye on it because Hardware is going to be constrained eventually, and it's not just the software that can compensate for it. The other one is network speed. Global broadband is growing, and it's growing very fast. But we still have to take into consideration because the developing world is still far behind. And when I say developing world, I mean you know such remote, distant locations as Equatorial Guinea, Bolivia, and even in my hotel. I don't know about you guys, but when I jump onto my hotel Wi-Fi, I'm on there waiting forever to get anything. And it drives me nuts. And I'll show you later how this ends up impacting me. But um, another one of the constraints is interrupted attention. One of the principles of mobile-first design is that you assume that people have one eyeball and one finger. And that's like you design for that. But in reality, the constraints have always been here. We've always had to deal with all of these. These aren't new to mobile or new to anything we haven't dealt with. It's just really always been easier to ignore it because it's not our problem. And I'm sure you guys have heard one of these quotes or something like it. I may have even said it at some point. But like, they should get a bigger monitor because you know everyone has 1024 by 768. Who uses that old equipment anymore? 
well, maybe they should, you know, go to the doctor and get their vision checked because 10 pixels of font size is perfect. Um, or people just don't use computers that way, which is another way of saying, uh, I don't want to deal with it. But mo mobile has actually forced us, because of its popularity and how much it ingrains into our own lives, is that we actually are considering others and ourselves and looking at other use cases. So what are some principles and some guiding points for mobile-first design? One, you don't have to start from scratch. That's kind of the big, the big thing that I see a lot of people say that, that, like, oh, well, you know what, we're not at that point. We can't just throw out everything we have and start over and do it mobile first. But in reality, you don't have to. What you do is design for mobile as if it were first, and then use that exercise to improve the desktop experience. And what I mean is, is there's a lot of junk that gets added to an interface. Um, now, I, I don't like crapping on other people's UIs, especially when they're highly focused technical ones uh, that may seem complicated to me, but they accomplish a specific task. But when I think about complicated UIs, I think of the Bloomberg terminals for analyzing stock quotes. And in reality, I, it's great, it works for them, but a lot of people approach their websites that they're going to be giving to their clients and showing to the world as if it were something like this. They just dump tons of information and like, expect people to understand and follow along. You may have heard this quote before. A designer knows when he has achieved perfection, not when there's nothing left to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. And it's somewhat trite and somewhat cliche, but in reality, if you approach it from that of like, what can we actually get rid of that's not essential, go with that. Ultimately, when you're designing, you want to keep the end goal in mind above the design. Designers, a lot of times, have a tendency to add flourishes, add things that are beautiful, but ultimately are a distraction or, at the end, just non-essential to what you're trying to accomplish. And that's great, but it should not sacrifice the end goal of that design. The design should serve why you're doing it. And if that means, you know, hey, we're going to have to not use this font or we're not going to be able to use these images, because ultimately, in order to get a conversion, that's going to be the most important thing. The other principle is content is more important than navigation. So whenever I try to book a flight, I have to go here. And I don't know about you, but I get lost every time I try to do this. I go to the page, and I'm like, wait a second, where do I need to go? And then I, my mouse starts wandering around, thinking it's going to just accidentally bump into the thing I need to do. And then I eventually can find it. But in reality, there's two things I'm going to do when I come to this website. It's definitely not book a cruise. And it's definitely not rent a car. It's going to be to get my plane ticket or to check in. That's, that's essentially the, all I'm going to do. I'm not going to worry too much about all the other stuff. And this is a good, now granted, in this case, I am kind of crapping on someone else's UI without any context. But um, to me, it's a good example of what I'm going there for versus what they're trying to push onto me. I'm sure some of you may remember the old liferay.com design. This kind of had similar challenges. Um, I remember when we were actually doing this design, just stakeholders galore, everyone saying, ah, we need this. This is really important. I mean, we have, let's see if I can point, like we got a whole training schedule, and we got, oh, no, but we need to help simplify things and get users on their way. Oh, but we got all this stuff we want to help promote. And not only that, but we don't even have enough room for all the things we want to promote. So let's just go ahead and make a carousel. It, it just was like, there was no decision to say, hey, this is what's simple. So as a good example, I really like what the liferay.com web team has actually done with going with the mobile-first approach and with simplifying things. And it takes a lot of discipline to do this, but they actually just cut back on all of the cruft and said, you know, what is it that, if nothing else, we want our users to walk away from the website experience with this information, knowing this. And that's what they did. They went ahead and, and simplified things down and pared it down to just the essentials. The other principle is keep navigation within context. So what does this mean? And I'll use liferay.com as an example of one pattern, which is just go ahead and show an overlay and propose it that way. There are some people who on their mobile site, they'll actually just completely cover the page or take you to another location in order to actually access the links. Users always get thrown off by this, like, where am I now? Where, once I, if I change my mind, where do I go? Just make sure to keep it in context. Another pattern is you don't have to just overlay everything. You can slide things over, 
but show some sort of like the existing context and content of the site so that way users aren't just thrown off. Especially if you think about it, when you're using your phone, or your computer for that matter, when you do an action, you may or may not be immediately acting on that decision. So you may be, oh, open up the navigation, and then a kid comes running up to you crying, or you, you, know, you get a phone call, you gotta do something, and your mind gets shifted instantly. When you come back to it, you shouldn't have to be wondering, what in the world, where am I now? How do I get back? What, like, your, your memory's pretty volatile in that case because it's subject to so many different circumstances. Try to keep the design between device views as sim similar as possible. And we've learned this a lot um, with Library 6 i 2 The mobile and the, the desktop views end up being kind of different because we weren't following a direct mobile-first approach with that. But we learned that doing that helps, like keeping them similar helps limit that kind of jarring experience between when a user may just have their window resized or when they may be just, you know, viewing something in an iframe. And a good example to me, again, is the liferay.com site and how they accomplish that. You can tell that basically when you're on a smaller view versus a larger view, you don't, you're not confused about where you are. It's a very similar design. The, basically, the navigation stays the pretty much same, except on the larger one, we just take advantage of more space. So it's really good, things stack properly, and it really limits that jarring behavior. Now, I'll take one moment, and this goes back to the hotel Wi-Fi thing. Um, custom fonts. I'm torn on this because the designer part of me loves the beauty of custom typography and being able to have a wide selection to choose from. The user in me gets really upset when I'm on a crappy hotel connection. In, I could be in South Korea with the fastest internet in the world, and I could just have the bad connection, and I get this, and I'm stuck here for 30 seconds to three minutes just staring at this, or this, and this is an actual screenshot from my phone from a real website, and to be honest, I just wanted to get some information. When the font finally loaded three minutes later, it really didn't look all that different from the default fonts that come with the browser. So in reality, there are better ways to lazily load that font and apply it, and if it really causes a massive shift, look at what you're doing and see, does this really matter? Is it important for the end user, or is it worth making them wait? Um, and that, that one's you're gonna have to decide, but I would just say, as a user, please don't do it. I, 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 I care more about your content than I care about the kerning of the, the font. Um, so now for mobile-first development. So a couple principles, and then I'll get into some kind of code. Uh, don't tie the screen size to the input method. This one, we've struggled with a lot because a lot of times like, oh, for a phone, they got touch. No big deal. In reality, they don't always have touch. And sometimes they have touch, but it's not a phone. Um, you can't assume that one equals the other and infer it. Instead, just test for one versus the other. Um, yeah, a large screen doesn't mean a mouse input either. Uh, a couple guys at our work have uh, these Dell computers with the touch screen, um, and a couple people have those phablets that kind of have, you know, stylus input. The size and the input method aren't one-to-one -one ratio, so test for the input method separately. Um, don't hide critical functionality behind keyboard shortcuts or gestures. This is a good principle anywhere, but I'll go to a website on my phone and it'll say, oh, press control H to view help. And then there's no other way to get to any help. And you can't accomplish anything. Um, yeah, so then I just sit there with no input, no way to raise my keyboard. And I'm just like, all right, well, I'll look at you later, I guess. Um, it, those things can be useful, but they're not very discoverable. Uh, end users, most often than not, don't know what in the world how to do it. And more often than not, we all have our own system of keyboard shortcuts that make sense for our system. So don't make that the only way in which people can accomplish the main tasks. Um, so mobile for CSS. Kind of general principle here is think in min width and not max width. And what this means is you want to just have the default styling, no media queries, have that be for the smallest devices. That's just your default. Then you're going to add media queries for each breakpoint that you want to go upward and start scaling that out. So what that looks like here is you have a div and that sets your width or does whatever design you want. Um, 
and I'll point to here, and then you would add a media query and say, the, at a minimum width of 420, go ahead and change these styles. And then on up, add a minimum width of 980. Um, in reality, it can be anything you want, but that's the general principle. It's start out small, this is what we're at, and then just keep progressively going up from there. You want to assume that your content is going to be in a narrow column. So Jorge's kind of talked about this, but it's been one of those things in Liferay of like wanting some sort of widget view of the HTML, and that's useful, but if you just assume that your stuff is always going to be in a narrow column, it takes care of that for you, because it could be in a narrow column, or it could be in you know, a giant large device, but you're never going to really know. Here's the one caveat to this. Media queries don't help with styling for when it's in a narrow column. Your media query may be handling like, oh, the window's this big, but your, your portlet or your application is just stuck in this narrow column. How do you handle this? So, yeah, how can you tell, it, especially if an image loads up on the page and shifts stuff over, now your stuff is back. How do, you, how do you detect these sorts of things? And, and still have it perform well, because you can do that. Basically, what you can do is you can use JavaScript to sit there and ping each element that you want to track and say, how wide are you? How wide are you? Unfortunately, doing that causes the browser to lock up and repaint everything, and performance ends up being terrible. So a former uh, employee of Liferay uh, and the guy who created normalize.css that Bootstrap uses, um, really awesome guy, came up with this way to do it and have it perform really well, and it's freaking ingenious. So what do you do? You get this JavaScript library, and this is kind of a segue between the CSS to the JavaScript portion. But you have this small JS file, it's like a couple of kilobytes, um, and you add this attribute on there, the data alt class. Basically what it's saying is, give this class all the time, to, no matter when it runs, and then you can say, okay, give it this class, which can be anything you want at this breakpoint, this class at this breakpoint, and so on and so on. So here's a video of how it works. Uh, oh, I guess I gotta click it, yeah. So as you can see, I added some resizing to sit there and do it, but you can tell that as the elements are resized, the CSS is changing them differently. Um, and you get a different style on there, based on, just on the width of it. How does it do it behind the scenes? How does it perform very well? Like I said, it's totally ingenious. But basically what it does is it just implants a completely hidden iframe into the parent of these columns. And it just listens to the window resize event on there, and which bumps out and changes the class on that element. And it's been it works in IE8. It's been tested with uh, hundreds of div or hundreds of iframes being run on the page, and it basically only will fire those events if something actually changes the width of that. It's totally brilliant because every other solution up until now has been so hokey and just causes all sorts of things to start grinding onto the processor. So this is really cool. Um, and again, I thought I'd include that just in case someone didn't know like why that URL was there or where in the world, like wh whether it'd be useful. So um, that kind of segues into mobile-first JavaScript. JavaScript is going to be your most powerful feature detection that you can actually use. Um, you can test for almost anything. I mean, there's some things you can't test for, but of the stuff you care about, most of it you'll be able to do, whether they can support touch, whether they can support uh, the geolocation API, CSS media queries even. Um, it does add a cost, so try to leverage it smartly. Um, if you're using like Liferay 6.2 with Alloy, uh, we have a way to do it, to do the feature detection without a significant cost at runtime. Now, a lot of people will use something like Modernize, <clears throat> sorry, Modernizer, which will just run all of it on page load. And so it'll just do all these tests, whether you need them or not. Um, you can go ahead and lazy load anything, practically, images, scripts, fonts, anything you want. But the way it does this, the way it will lazily you know, test that functionality is, here's a good example. You create a, mo a module, and let's say you have this module and you only want it to load if they support the geolocation API. And you really only want it to load because it's implementing additional functionality to some other module. And that other module may or may not be on the page. Maybe it's a search widget. Maybe it's some sort of uh, filtering mechanism. Who knows? But you 
you maybe only have it on page A, but not on page B. So you don't want to do this location test every single time for every page, even if you're not going to use that functionality. So what you do instead is you say, OK, this module, give it a condition and give it a name of the same name. And this is the test. And this test is just a function. It can do anything you want. But in this case, we're going to say, OK, if geolocation is inside of the navigator object, then it's going to return true. And th it, this trigger right here just means only fire this whole condition when this guy's loaded. When that guy's loaded, we then will you know, go to the, we'll pull in this module, and it will be loaded then. But it keeps your, your feature testing from overloading the page and getting everything, uh, uh, get it, slowing everything down. Here's another example of something else. You could actually do the exact same thing, but instead testing a media query. Uh, in JavaScript, sorry, I broke the line just so it would fit on this slide, but um, you can test practically anything you want uh, that would run in JavaScript, of course. Um, but yeah, you just run it, and it'll keep it from overloading the page. The other aspect is mobile-first images. So lazy load on scroll, this is a pattern that a lot of people have seen. Um, but in case you haven't, here's generally how you do it. In your HTML, yeah, one option is you just give it a source pointing to a spacer, some dummy file that you know is going to be really quick to return and cached easily, um, and then put the real source on, uh, in a data attribute. Then in 6.2, for instance, you could just load it up like this. There's a plugin called uh, Scroll Info. You just run a UI use Scroll Info and plug it onto the body. You can then say body Scroll Info on Scroll. Um, just walk through. Every time it scrolls, it'll just grab. Okay, what images are actually on screen? And then you can loop through them and you can check the data source and then say, okay, if that's not empty and it doesn't equal what's currently in the source, go ahead and update it, and now your images will only load then um, instead of loading all of them on page load. So the, the request will be a lot faster. The other one I want to go over is SVG. If you can, in, it's within your support matrix, uh, which is IE8 or IE9 and above, um, I would highly recommend it, both for icons and for other assets that you can use logos. There are a lot of benefits to it. One, resolution independence. Um, you don't have to like create different versions for different display densities. You can just create one file and display it across all display densities. Um, for icons and other things, it can be styled via CSS. And this is really cool because with like font icons, the downside is the most you can style with it is the color. Um, and it's one solid color, and it can, you know, every, every part of it has to be that color or not. Um, but with SVG, you can, via CSS, target any piece of it. So if it has some paths inside that you say, no, no, I need those to be blue and the rest of it to be lighter blue, um, you can define that and give it its own custom style. And the other thing, and not a lot of people know this, but it's responsive. And I'll give you an example. You can place media queries inside of your SVG file. And this is really useful. Let's say your design department has a style guide that says, this is the way our logo is allowed to be used. You have a large one, you have a small one, or a medium one, and then just the bare minimum one. Those are what you're allowed to use. In your SVG file, right there, inside the defs, you can just dump a style tag. And you can add the CSS that you want, and then put your media queries in there, and basically manipulate the logo to do whatever you want. So in this case, you're going like they're going to be the media queries are going to be calculated differently depending on how you actually embed the SVG into the page. So embedding on the page, the media queries are relative to the window. And when I say embedding on the page, what I mean is you take the XML from the file and place it in the page. Um, and the benefit of that is that's the only way you can have CSS actually style the sub-elements of that SVG. But in a case like a logo, you probably don't want some theme developer really messing around with the colors and styling too much. Um, so you may not want to do that. But the benefit of the other way is just linking to it, putting an image SVG, is that the media queries are calculated relative to the size of the image. So that means that you can do something like this, where basically you have one file that has 
the exact same information, and depending on how wide you set it, or the height or anything you give it, it will change the display of the logo. And now you can use it anywhere. And you can combine this with CSS media queries in your CSS. So in your CSS, you could define a media query that says, hey, on a small screen, go ahead and set the logo image to being 50 pixels wide or 100 pixels wide. And it will recalculate that and shove it on there. Sorry, I think you have a question. Does it have to be? No, it does not have to be. But the benefit is, um, if, if you want it to be where you link like this, it does have to be. Sorry, I'm supposed to repeat the questions. He asked, does the, C the, does the CSS have to be inside the SVG? Technically, no, except for this case right here. If you want to link to it as an image and have it calculate based on the size of the image, then it has to be inside of that because that's the scope of its container. Um, but otherwise, you could put it inside of, inside of the regular CSS, and now it will be in the scope of the window. The benefit is that basically of having it in there is that it's all contained in that one file, and whether you decide to embed it in there via some sort of include mechanism or doing an AJS request and loading in the page, however you want to include it, you, can, you have the freedom to do either way. Um, so it's really great, and it's really useful. Um, yeah, I don't know how much time I have left. I don't think I have a timer, but that's pretty much it for me. Um, you can reach me on Twitter, GitHub, Nate Cavanaugh, um, but I'm also willing to take questions too, so. I don't think we really have a time for Oh, question. do we not? Okay. Well, maybe one. Uh, can we take one question? Anyone? Anyone questions? Don't be shy. All right. About no? knowing Nate, okay. he's going to be around, so feel free to grab him for a coffee and talk to him. Thank you, guys.